When South Australia lifted its 16-year ban on genetically modified crops last year, Tim Morecambe didn't waste time, becoming one of the first farmers in the state to get his hands on some GM canola. It was a great occasion, I thought, for South Australia to finally catch up with the other states. I, I felt that agriculture in South Australia had been left behind. Tim Morecambe farms near Bordertown in the state's southeast. Until now, he's grown canola varieties which have been developed using conventional breeding. But ryegrass has been getting the better of some of those crops. He has high hopes what's going in the ground now will help change that. I'd like to hope it'll set this ground up, possibly for the next five years. Yeah, to be able to use glyphosate over the top of our canola, it, um, yeah, it's a game changer, I think. So there's obviously a canola seed there. If we do get a staggered germination of the ryegrass, um, at least we're going to have two goes of our, of our glyphosate applications. Tim Morecambe's agronomist says while the dry start was ideal for the herbicide-resistant GM canola, there hasn't been a huge uptake. I guess everyone's a little bit measured, and I think in South Australia there's been less than 50 growers that have put their name down for some. One of Nathan Tink's clients, who was very hesitant, but has been won over, is Monty Hards. He farms in both South Australia and Victoria, where GM canola has been grown since 2008. We tried it 10 years ago and it was not what we hoped for and didn't yield as well as we hoped and the, was shot before we harvested it, so we said we wouldn't bother with it again because it wasn't what we wanted. And then we tried it again last year and it performed really well. Like Tim Morecambe, the main appeal is having another tool in his kit to control weeds. But that control comes at a cost. The seeds are more expensive than non-GM canola, there's a technology fee and a discount at harvest. I definitely think if, if someone sits you down and said you can grow this variety or GM, and if you grow GM it's going to be possibly $50 a tonne less at harvest time, it's a a lot of people are going to stay well away from it straight away, regardless of what the, the benefit's going to be in the future. The next generation of Roundup Ready, the TrueFlex or the, the generation after that, they are going to be the ones that really give us a, a spike in yield. So that's, that's the exp exciting part for South Australia. One part of South Australia that won't be involved, at least for now, is Kangaroo Island, where the moratorium is still in place. That's because its GM-free canola fetches a premium in Japan. It's always been one of our more profitable crops um, right the way through. While Travis Bell is happy to keep planting non-GM canola while it pays off, he isn't opposed to genetically modified crops. The GM technology would work really well in our environment um, and if it wasn't for the markets, I'd, I would have been pushing really hard for it to be here. Back on the mainland, there were plenty pushing hard against the technology. Eleven South Australian councils, many of which cover wine producing regions, wanted to be in KI's position and stay GM free, but their applications were rejected. Growers in the McLaren Vale, though, haven't given up. Almost 40% of vineyards in the McLaren Vale, south of Adelaide, are organic or biodynamic. The owner of this one says that's helped the region build a brand around sustainability. He says lifting the GM ban threatens to tarnish that brand, even if no genetically modified crops are actually planted near here. If I have a European importer right, or distributor coming to me and saying, Mike, um, what is happening with GM in South Australia, um, they're concerned. Mike Brown hasn't lost any customers since the moratorium was lifted. But with the bottom already falling out of the China market, the winemaker says now is not the time to test relations with European buyers who are opposed to genetically modified organisms. 
the GM threat on top of perhaps we'll call it the China issue, it creates another complication for a business to be able to um, continue to grow and continue to be profitable. So we've certainly hit a brick wall. The local Grape Wine and Tourism Association is tackling the perceived threat by developing a voluntary code of conduct for the region, which leaves no one guessing where signatories stand on GM. We can take that to the international market, we can take that to government and state that it's clear that our farm, uh, our farmers and our producers value uh, not welcoming genetically modified crops within our region or genetically modified material within any of our production methods. An independent review found the moratorium cost SA canola growers $33 million over 15 years. While Jennifer Lynch says lifting it creates a barrier to trade for the wine industry, farmers like Tim Morecambe are excited about what's around the corner. There's just so much more breeding that plant breeders can breed into their crops. Frost is such a big issue. If we could get some frost tolerance into our crops, it'd be worth, you know, billions. OK, Kerry, so I'm going to take you into where we store a lot of our GM seeds. Enter University of Adelaide plant scientist Matt Tucker. So do you have a lot of GM seeds? A lot, yes. Yeah, so a lot of research has been going on here at Waite for around about oh, the last 20 years or so. We're going to come down now into the GM seed dungeon. Oh, is this it? Uh, just take a right over here. OK. And here you are. Oh, oh behind right. the door. <laughs> Sounds a bit eerie. <laughs> So this, this is all GM? This is all GM seed. We've got a lot of wheat and barley in here that's been engineered for improved tolerance against frost, against drought and um, increased yield. So are these all ready to go? This is ready to go. It's all been through its uh, final stages of, of trialling um, and essentially it's ready for a commercial partner to come in and say we want to trial it, we want to trial it in different sites and we want to invest in this research. And have any yet? No. Lifting the ban makes it easier for scientists to do more field testing. The question is, will the commercial sector take things any further? While GM oil seeds are produced on a large scale in Australia and GM corn and soybeans are widely grown overseas, getting GM wheat, barley and other edible crops beyond the research phase is more challenging. The biggest roadblock is still going to be the market. So is the market going to accept what we're producing? We can do a lot of trials in our glass houses here. We can do them in selected field sites, but it needs industry to say, yep, this is a technology that's going to make a difference. So how long have you been working on GM vines for? So the group here has been... Across the road, it's a similar story at the CSIRO where scientists have been working on genetically modified grapevines for two decades. So what have you actually developed? What we've developed are the only premium wine grapes in the world, uh, things like Shiraz and Tempranillo, that have powdery and downy mildew resistance through using transgenic approaches. And have these ever gone outside the building? They've gone to our glass house, but they've come back into tissue culture because we don't see any path to market to, to actually using them in the industry. So this is just what's left, is it? It's a museum piece. Research scientist Ian Dry believes these are actually more sustainable than many commercial vines because they don't need to be sprayed with fungicides. But there are no plans to test that in the field now the ban has been lifted because the local wine industry won't use them. Until all of the major wine uh, producing countries in the world decide that they are willing to accept GM technology and there, there are no negative impacts of that, uh, Australia is unlikely to adopt the technology because it could be frozen out of export markets. The struggle to get some GM plants in the ground hasn't stopped Adelaide University shooting for the stars. These researchers are designing genetically modified crops for space. And while it doesn't look that high tech at a glance, this $80,000 microgravity box is a vital part of the experiments. 
plants obviously didn't evolve to grow in space. It's, it's a somewhat foreign environment for them. There are whole kinds of constraints that we uh, are not familiar with here on Earth. So for instance, water becomes sticky and creepy in space. There's no gravity draining the water from the soil. And in fact, it clings to surfaces and it can envelop plants completely. So it needs new ways to cope with those kind of conditions. So we can see it's quite straight at the moment when we're on Mars gravity, but a bit of curvature when we push it down to zero gravity. While these sorts of conversations would have been laughable a few years ago, he chilled up. The race to send people to Mars is getting serious, with the US and China recently landing rovers on the red planet. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars. The amount of work that needs to be done to get plants ready for being that nutritional source for space is probably going to take at least 10 years or so. We have to start now. And after a frustrating couple of decades working with the technology on Earth, Professor Matthew Gilliam is hoping his team will have better luck in space. In terms of acceptance, I think it's a, an easy sell for astronauts surrounded by all that technology. Space allows us, it frees us up to really work on these technologies to make rapid gains and improve growth rate, reduce waste, improve nutrient use efficiency in ways that we haven't been able to do here on Earth, but then bring these solutions back. From solving weed issues at ground level to supporting life far beyond the paddock, the lifting of the GM moratorium may not have universal support, but it is giving South Australia an opportunity to explore new horizons. <laughs>